Thanks again for everyone to joining this presentation. What we will do in this presentation is we would like to uh, first of all introduce you about supply chain miner, in particular, first focusing on what is a supply chain, right? We'll discuss a few concepts of the supply chains. Uh, and then we'll move on to and then explain a little more details about the supply chain miner. Uh, again, my name is Shin, and I'm a faculty member at Rady. And with me, I have Chris Gopal, who is also teaching um, MBA uh, undergrad class in supply chain and operations. We also have Zal Firos, again, a faculty member here, this, uh, teaching supply chain and business analytics classes and, and operations classes here in the undergraduate program. With that, um, let's begin. Okay, so Chris, I'll, I'll lead the slide. And if you need to move on, just let me know. Okay, let's go. I'll do that. So before okay. I start, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shin. And thank you everybody for putting this together. Um, I'd just like to start off the discussion by saying that in today's environment, supply chain management and the supply chain is probably the most important business function and discipline around. Um, all of you have been involved and watched or did something with the recent elections. And many of you may not have caught this, but just before the elections, when they were talking about what they wanted to see done, both the incumbent president and the current elected president mentioned supply chains. They didn't mention anything else. They mentioned supply chains and international supply chains. So I just wanted to let that be there with you to show you that, look, this is a really important topic. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Shin, next page. Yeah. So what is the supply chain? I'd like to start off by defining the supply chain. Um, the next one. Okay, let's stop there. The supply chain is complex and encompassing. It's the flow of products, services, and cash from raw materials all the way to manufacturers of different types, to wholesalers and distributors, and to the retailers across multiple geographies, regions, countries, channels, online, retail, whatever you buy, tax structures, political environments, which is a big, big deal today, and very social structures. Dr. Shin? And this, the entire supply chain goes from the customer to the consumer and back. So it all revolves around the customer. And it's connected by transportation and storage activities. Um, it's integrated through planning, integration. It balances cost, cash, services, and service levels. You have to adhere to government regulations and be socially responsible. And you have to manage risk. So these are a lot of big words. Let's just talk about what is a supply chain from the point of view of something most of us own? An iPhone. This Apple supply chain, and by the way, the CEO of Apple is the former head of Apple supply chain. So you can see how important this is to companies. It's a movement and flow of everything in this iPhone, the glass, the display, the chips, the switches, everything from a variety of different customers, I mean suppliers across the world to manufacturers who put it together. It's then sent, if it's okay, by plane to various distribution centers across the world to Apple stores or directly to you when you order it online. It's a complex bit. and over 70% of a company's cash and costs are embedded in the supply chain. So it's that important. Can we go to the next one? Okay. 
it's critical to the company's success, competitiveness, and the economy. I'd just like to uh, give you a few quotes. So Dr. Shin, you could just uh, uh, go forward and one more, that's it. Um, many of you know the limited brands, I hope. Um, Len Schlesinger is the vice chairman, basically said, so you don't understand the importance of the supply chain management to your business, I would love to compete with you. Michael Dell, Dell is a supply chain company. I'm a former Dell person. Why am I focused on it? Because the supply chain is a barometer of my business. Tim Cook talks about the worldwide supply chain all the time. And then my favorite quote that I have um, from somebody I truly admire, Elon Musk says, this supply chain stuff is really tricky. So it's complex. It's the answer to competitiveness. It's powerful in the business world and it's tricky. Next one, Dr. Shin. Okay, let's stop there. Let's talk about what the supply chain is. Okay. It starts off with you, the customer, or anybody, the customer. You browse on the internet or in a shop. You select something, you order something, you receive it, you use it, you pay for it, you return it, and you communicate to the supplier. That's what the customer does. And the customer, you again, buys it through various channels. You'll buy it through retail, might go to Nordstrom's, get a shirt, buy it through kiosks, might go to um, Costco through one of their kiosks, buy a small computer, you might do it online through Amazon, catalogs, service center, or you might order it directly from your devices in some way. And there are four types of supply chains. There's the forward supply chain from the supplier to you. Once this thing is done with and you throw it away or hopefully recycle it, there's a return supply chain going all the way back. There's a service chain. So those of you who have computers know all about this because these are the service people who come to service your boxes for your TV and your supply chain and all that. That's a ch chain and the digital chain all the various software and applications that you use. And if you can proceed, Dr. Shin. And what do the supply chain people do? They source from someplace, they buy, they make it. From suppliers all the way to distributors to financing companies. Once that's done, they move and deliver it to you the last mile through various fulfillment networks, DCs, distribution centers, spare centers, customs, all of that. Some of you might actually be, might actually have been there or live in the Inland Empire, okay, San Bernardino, Riverside. You will see nothing but distribution centers there. People stocking inventory so that they can hedge it and supply to you. And then supply chain management is the planning of all this, matching demand and supply and inventory, introducing new products and services into the market, um, developing the strategy for this on a global basis, and putting in place the network. Where do I locate my plant, my supplier, my distribution center, any of these things? Managing this through global trade, and regulations. And then um, if you could proceed, managing corporate social responsibility and working with all the various people that you have to work with, governments, economic groups, communities, partners, and enabling it through people, finance, and technology, all connected through the internet of things. And whenever I show this to senior executives, they go, wow, oh heck. And that's exactly the response. It's big, it's complex, and it's what makes companies successful. In the old days, you used to have management people from theorists and universities and so on saying, 
you know, companies compete. No longer supply chains compete. And to a bigger extent, industries compete. So basically, this is the supply chain. This is what we'll be talking about when you become, take the supply chain minor, enroll in any of our courses, we'll be talking about this and piece of that. But the thing I'd like to bet to you because you're one of the new generation of people with skills and supply chain management today demands a new and integrated set of skills, which is right up your alley. So you have the necessary capabilities and the skills and the courses around, including the supply chain minor, to be like Tim Cook, to join a company and go all the way up to be the CEO. So what it needs is the supply chain management, which we talk about in the minor, technology and the management of technology. How do we use different technologies in business and the supply chain? Supply chain finance, costs, financing, the analytics involved, which some of you have seen, we have a business program in that. Problem solving, very important. Communication and people management and international business. This is the critical aspect of the supply chain. It's the people. About a year and a half ago, there was a survey of all the various um, CEOs and COOs to ask them what are their top three problems? Global people. Among the top three was supply chain management talent. They don't have enough of it and it's a problem. Now the supply chain has very well-defined objectives. If we can go forward, firstly from the top, what Wall Street looks for from a supply chain is driving shareholder value. Free cash flow from operations, margins and returns. That's the supply chain. A level down, it's all about driving customer satisfaction and brand equity across the entire life cycle experience. Think about when you buy something. You order it, you need the right information. You need to know where it is at all times. You need to get the right paperwork. You need to have it delivered at the right time to the right place. You need it to work. You need to be able to detrash it. You need to be able to buy it again. All this is part of the supply chain. Next one. Sure. And it's all about driving operations excellence. At lowest cost, minimum working capital, agility and resilience. And the five arrows to the left are there for a purpose. These are the five things that drive share price, shareholder value, and they're all part of the supply chain. Uh, you probably have had this as well. We've got a military flyover right now, which is pretty hard. So, uh, and then finally, Dr. Chen, it's all about managing the supply chain economically for corporate social responsibility. Five years ago, when I was in the boardroom running supply chains, I never heard of this thing. I never even cared about it. Today, it's very important. Everybody's talking about it and we have to work, work through it. And just to give you an example, next page. Next. Ah, there we go. Just an example here. Um, uh, before I hand this over to Dr. Shin. This is an example of how a simple t-shirt travels. It starts off <laughs> Lubbock, Texas, sent over to Shanghai, China, made, goes back to Europe, goes to Tanzania, oh, and goes home to a, to a couple of, uh, to its uh, customers. It is global, it's complex. That's why I'm so pleased to see so many of you from so many different countries and different schools. You're ideally placed to take on these challenges in the future. And 
if you have any questions about what is a supply chain, I hope I've given you a very short, quick feeling of what this thing is. It's complex. It takes the attention of presidents, CEOs, Wall Street analysts, everybody. And it's critical from the point of view of how we manage uh, our business. Uh, just to give you an additional perspective, uh, I, in addition to other things, I'm a member of the Defense Business Board, uh, advisory board to the Pentagon. And one of the most important things that we deal with and we have dealt with is the issue of national supply chains. So I'd like to leave you with that. If you have any questions, contact any of us and we'll be happy to talk about it. At this point, let me turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Shin. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, what I will do is I'll just discuss a few examples of the supply chains, right? Let's start with this simple T-shirt here. That is exactly what I'm wearing right here, right? And this T-shirt is definitely made out of cotton. Actually, China, if, especially if you think about Southeast Asia, that's a great place to grow cottons, even in terms of the weather and the climate, right? However, number one ex cotton export country in the world, surprisingly, it is actually United States right here. USA is indeed number one cotton export in the world. Right, and you see it right here. Rubok, Texas is indeed the place that people grow cottons, right? And then they export that cottons all the way to China. Well, actually in this uh, <clears throat> t-shirt case to Vietnam, right? And then produce there in Vietnam and then ship it all the way to New York, right? And, or maybe even to LA and San Diego to sell this t-shirt. And then if it sells well, that's great. If it doesn't, then they will ship it all the way to places in Africa, in this case, Tanzania, and then sell it at 10 cents a shirt, right? That is one travel of a t-shirt. And let me show you a different kind of t-shirt, okay? With that, I will take off my t-shirt. And you see my another t-shirt right here. It is actually, it's kind of hard to see, but it is a Patagonia, okay? First of all, the material itself is different. It's the same cotton, but the difference is these cottons, it's actually all recycled cottons, right? Chris mentioned about the returns, right? For the supply chain, even think about now materials, sometimes it's from a raw cottons, some other times like this, it's from the recycled ones, right? Number two, where do you think this is made from? Not in China, right? Indeed, in Patagonia's case, it's made in Mexico, right? So now you see, even in terms of the whole supply chains, in particular in the manufacturing, I have done some research in this area. What I have seen is recently, I see some supply chain movement, right? Or realignment. Many companies are trying to come, let's say, rebalance their supply chains out of Southeast Asia and coming back sometimes to the United States or sometimes to Mexico, right? Which you call either nearshoring or reshoring, right? We see that movement. And with that, the advantage is think about all the time that is needed to ship it, you know, ship cottons from here to China and all the way from China to here. That takes a lot of time. Right. If we ship, if we actually, let's say, you know, uh, manufacture the things from Rubok, Texas, we grow the cottons from Texas, make the plant over there, or maybe just right across the border, right in Mexico, produce it there, and then ship it to ship it back to USA. That'll take much less time. Right. With that, we get the speed. Right. We with that, we get much more to some extent resilient and agile supply chain. Right. This is one example of a supply chain. Let me give you another example, which I'm sure you guys are all know at this point, which is a movie industry, right? which has been changed quite a bit because of the pandemic. But if you look at the whole industry as from suppliers all the way to the distributors and the retailers, first of all, there is a supplier who are suppliers who are actually making the movies, which will be studios. Right? 
And then used to be, it will go to theaters, right? And then it'll come to DVDs, right? Walmart and rentals like Blockbuster, Netflix and Redbox, and sometimes even um, a uh, st streamings through Amazon and iTunes. One company that I would like to discuss in the industry is um, a movie rentals, right? Um, how many of you know, still know this company called Blockbuster? If you know, just raise your hand. Let me see how many of you still know. Okay, good. I see one, two, Rina, good. Some of you, um, great, I see even four. So one thing about Blockbuster is this. Before Blockbuster, right? It used to be all the rental business. It was all mom and pop business. Okay, now Blockbuster came and what happened was it basically killed all mom and pop video rentals. Okay, so um, the reason sort of a, a one factor why Blockbuster managed to kill all the mom and pop small video rentals is the scale. Right? If you think about small mom and pop video rental stores, it's, it's small. Right? And because it's small, they cannot keep lots of copies, which means if let's say the new released uh, vi videos just came for rental, you go there, good luck. You will not be able to find that video, right? However, Blockbuster came with this. I mean, as you can see in that gigantic store came with the huge scale, right? And with that scale, they managed to keep tons of copies of videos, right? And with that, customers will be able to find what they want even when, when the new release video just came, right? So that was sort of one of the power of Blockbuster came to the market and compete against and compete away all those mom and pop video rental stores. However, now in the whole world, there is only one Blockbuster uh, video rental stores left. Next time, if you have a chance to visit Bend, Oregon, visit there. There is one last survivor of Blockbuster, right? That became a huge place, souvenir shop for Blockbuster. And indeed, I believe that they are, they are even listed in Airbnb. You can even have a sleep there, right? So that's Blockbuster. But who killed the Blockbuster? What happened was Netflix came, right? Netflix came and originally Netflix business was actually um, sending DVDs through mail, right? And if you think about Netflix, now we are talking scales. Blockbuster came with this scale. Now think about the scale of Netflix distribution center, right? Again, compared to mom and pop stores, Blockbuster is big. Netflix, forget it, it's even bigger. Right, much bigger. It's the war of scales. Let me Netflix came and then say, let me show you what the real scale is. Right. And that was indeed the weapon for Netflix. Right. One weapon for Netflix, which is let's go for scale, right? Well, let's go for scale and we will dominate. Right. And indeed, it's not just Netflix. If you see bookstores, same thing, right? Same thing happened. You see mom and pop, small bookstores came. And the borders came, right? The big sort of a gigantic store of borders came and then basically killed all the mom and pop stores. And same thing, who killed those borders, right? Amazon came. And again, think about Amazon's distribution center, the wall of scales. Right? However, one thing interesting is this, Netflix easily managed to kill that um, blockbuster, the big store, right? However, how many of you know uh, this red box? Raise your hand if you know the red box. Good, Christina. Good, Becca. Now, red box is the one, right? If you go to any grocery stores, you will see that little red box, right? And you can actually rent a video there. And here, I want you to just think about it, which is, you know, Netflix with the huge scale killed the blockbuster. Red box? It's even smaller than, much smaller than Blockbuster. However, Netflix, even now, it's very hard. Netflix had a really, really hard time to kill Redbox. 
red box even now is still doing good, right? Why is that? Why, why Netflix can easily kill the blockbuster, but how come this little guy, red box, Netflix has a hard time to kill this little guy, red box, right? Think about that. And, and let me give you another example. We talked about Amazon, right? And Amazon also moved very strange, which is, hey, as I said, it's a wall of scales, right? There are those big uh, bookstores like Borders, right? Let's go kill that big store Borders, big bookstore Borders by having this huge gigantic distribution center. But then what are they doing now? Think about Amazon, what are they doing now? I don't know how many of you actually had a chance to visit UTC Mall, right? The Westfield Mall. If you go there, there is actually a small bookstore. It's actually a Amazon bookstore. Think about it, what are they doing? I thought they're going for the scale, right? They're going for the scale with the huge distribution center. Now they are reversing this scale and coming back to customers with the small stores, just like mom and pop stores, which is long gone. What are they doing, right? What are they doing? And also similarly here, Redbox, what is the secret weapon for Redbox? Why Netflix cannot easily kill the Redbox, right? This is exactly the topic of supply chain. Here, the key is, it is really driven by what kind of customers? In this case, what kind of movies that they keep, right? If you think about the red box, it's not the case that they keep any movies, right? They only keep particular type of movies, right? They only keep the type of movies that they know that it will sell well, right? It will sell fast. If they put the movies there, it will be rented fast. For example, think about all those new releases, right? If you see those, you know, the movies that nobody knows, Redbox never ever keep that uh, video DVD in their, uh, in their uh, Redbox, right? They will only keep those new releases so that they know that once they keep those, it will be rented out, right? So the key really is what is the selection of movies that they keep in Redbox. Amazon, same thing. Why do they come close to customers? Well, now they know what customers want in the sense that they know with all that information that they collected so far, they know what kind of books customers want in let's say UTC versus let's say somewhere in, in Seattle. They know that it's different and they will keep that particular selection of books that customers want in that particular location so that when they keep the books there, it will sell well, right? Once you know that, then you can do, you can enjoy the economies of scale without having the real scale, right? That is really one key. And, and again, if you see the red box, the scale is pretty small. And now let me just talk a little bit more about a, a retailing, in particular thinking about you know, uh, Amazon, which is now just not just a bookseller, but they are selling everything, right? But let's just talk a little bit about the history, right? In the, in the past, early days, the retailing was mostly a push cart, right? Uh, those carts come and they will try to sell things to you. And then one real innovation happened in the first supermarket store in the whole world, which was established in 1916 called Piggly Wiggly, right? Anyone from the South, anyone knows this supermarket called Piggly Wiggly? Again, raise your hand if you know this supermarket. Okay, I see Christina, good. Uh, Piggly Wiggly started as selling, well, in this case, right? It's basically, uh, you can see the pigs, right? So they are selling the meats, in particular, the pig meats. Right? Now, one sort of a, a, I will say the innovation that they came up with in the supermarket is this. Before Piggly Wiggly, the way that it worked is this. Customers will come and then they will tell the clerk that what they want, right? I want the eggs and I want the apples and whatnot, right? And the clerk will then go to the back room and then they will pick it up and then they will give it to the customers and the customers will then see and then pay, 
right? And then Piggly Wiggly came and they say, hey, why are we doing this all that picking thing, right? Let the customers do the work, right? And in supply chain, what do we call that? We call that as outsourcing, right? We do the work instead of doing the work, let's outsource this work in this case to the customers. And what a great idea that was, because after when they did that in their first supermarket, they found that one, they don't have to do the work. Customers are doing their work. Number two, surprisingly, although customers are working, they were happier. Customers were happier to pick their own apples, right? So that's one great innovation that Piggly Wiggly came as a supermarket. They outsourced it to their customers, their work to customers, and somehow, that made even customers happier. And that made definitely them happier as well because they have to work less, right? Now that's the retailing of the past, the retailing of the present. You see Costco's, you see Walmart's and Whole Foods. Again, I will say the importance of scale here, right? Now, let me give you another sort of a fancy example of retailing of the present. This is the example of, of Tesco Home Plus in Korea. If you see this, this guy right here, where do you think he is? Why don't I try uh, Sabrina again? Sabrina, any guess on where he is? Oh. Like a vending machine or something? Just... Like a vending machine, you may think. Well, he is actually right on the subway station, right? So in the subway station, you know, in, in Home Plus or Tesco, what they have is for just like any other stores, in their refrigerator, right? All the items are in, in, in a particular order. So whenever you go, whichever Tesco you go, all the things display the same, right? And they made that display on the subway station. And for example, on the way to work, you can actually open up your app and then scan the orange juice and, and Powerade or milk, right? The things that you want. And then you just put it in your cart. And once you come home in the evening, that'll be delivered at night. That'll, that'll be delivered during the day. So you can actually see and pick, pick them up right in front of your door at night, right? So that's again, another sort of the a innovation that came in retailing. And it's not only on the subway station, it'll be in the, um, in the bus station as well, right? So that's one example. And for sure, you guys will know the retailing of the future, right? That is for sure Amazon. One thing that I want you to think about is um, there are some benefits of economies of scale, but at the same time, there is something that is extremely hard to achieve some eco benefits of economies of scale, which is actually like Chris mentioned, last mile delivery, right? Think about, let's say, you know, if you think about sort of the big store and there is definitely a inbound shipping, coming to the store, delivering from the distribution center to the whole food store versus from whole food to the customers, right? That, that delivery from whole food to the customers, that's called the last mile. From the distribution center to the whole food, that's a inbound shipping. Inbound shipping from DC to whole food, that's a very cost uh, efficient, right? Because it comes with the 18 wheelers, right? The unit delivery cost will be pretty cheap. However, if you think about that last mile from whole food to an individual house, that is a very expensive uh, delivery, right? That last mile delivery. And one thing interesting you see is in Amazon's case, actually they're doing most of it. Um, now they're trying to do most of that last mile delivery by themselves. And you will see even in the transportation, that will be a huge, huge disruptor in the market. Right? And that logistics and transportation, in particular related to that last mile, is definitely one of the key areas of the supply chain. Right? So with that, I just gave you some taste of what it is in the supply chain. What I want to cover for the, for the last, let's say, five, five minutes, and then I'll open up some uh, Q&A, is about this supply chain miner. Right. Uh, if you go to this website in Ready, you can see what it requires to have a supply chain miner. And Andrew indeed just posted that website on the chat. Okay, so you can check. And one thing that I would like to say is actually um, declaring a miner. Right. So I know that some of you are even freshmen and sophomore. 
first of all, you know, I highly recommend you, if supply chain is of a little interest to you, even if it's a very little, I highly recommend to contact Anju, for example, and then declare that uh, you will pursue the supply chain miner. Why? Because one, there's no cost to it, right? You don't have to take classes to declare the miner. You, ju you just declare the miner. And what I recommend is once you declare the miner, you can then put that in your resume, right? Saying, hey, I declared supply chain miner, right? And then I hope that that will help you when you apply for the internship, right? Now that you know a little bit of supply chain, you can at least say you declare the minor in your resume and hopefully that'll help in your search for the internship, okay? So that's one thing that I recommend, just you know, do it right now. There is no commitment and no cost to that, okay? And now what actually it takes to get the minor, those are the uh, some related courses, right? If you take, um, let's say eight, is it eight courses? One, four, six courses, right? If you take six courses, you will get the supply chain minor. Those courses are here, one accounting class, and then there are four core classes. Both Chris and Zal are teaching uh, most of them. And then there are also some elective courses. Okay, for the elective courses, uh, business project management, uh, MGT 172 and MGT 166 business ethics and MGT 162 negotiations. Those are offered pretty much every quarter. And also um, there will be more courses of offered uh, next year related to MGT 177 and MGT 128R. That course is a remote only class which is actually offered every spring, okay? So uh, with that, I will uh, conclude about the supply chain minor introduction and I will open up the floor for any uh, questions.